they tell us that, you know, we have three mothers while we're on earth. And uh, they tell us our natural mother and our second mother is the lodge, the teepee, but in modern day, it's our home. They say you come into a home. Wherever you go, you've always got somebody's back to go, and I'd like to welcome you into your second mother uh, home. And they say our third mother is our Mother Earth, which gives life to everything. And uh, that is the way I was told, and uh, I'd like to welcome you into our home. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Well, as far as back as I can remember, you know, I remember uh, staying here. My parents lived down the road a ways, but I would come here on weekends to my aunt. Her name was Agnes Cummins, and I would live with her through the weekends, and uh, we would ride horses in this area back on the hills up here in the pine tree area. And uh, there's a place called Canyon Creek that we would follow and that goes clear to the foot of the mountain. And uh, we used to get in trouble for going so far back there, you know, on account of wild animals and whatnot. And uh, we'd be gone all day and they'd be looking for us. And back then nobody had any cell phones or anything. So uh, they'd be looking for us and we'd either be there or out east of here in the Wolf Mountains riding horses. And uh, that's some of my memories I have from growing up. And then hunting and fishing was a big deal, you know, like going to the buffalo pasture from here and uh, fishing throughout the spring before high water and then later in fall, fishing like that. And then some of the stories that were related to us by some of the elders that lived in this community. I remember old man, Tom Yellowtail, old man, Charlie Redrove, and my aunt, Agnes, and uh, they related a lot of the old stories to us of the uh, battle. There was a big battle just uh, south of here, about a mile, mile and a half around the Rath Camp Ranch, and uh, a little east of there, there's a high point on a hill. There was a Crow warrior who had stood off about 30 or 40 Sioux that caught him alone. He stood on top of that uh, hill, and they wouldn't give up. It took them days and days, and he was up there all that time. They'd send somebody after him, and he'd uh, they couldn't get to him. So they sent after reinforcements for something, and there was about 50 of them showed up, and they finally all charged him, and that is the only reason they got rid of him is by charging him in a big force like that. But he withstood that attack for like a week or so before he was ever, before he was ever killed. And stories like that, uh, there was a camp south of here, like I mentioned, the uh, Rath Camp Ranch. They attacked a small village of crows, but somehow they got news that the enemy was coming. They came from the east. They came from the south. And they attacked that small village, and they uh, killed most of the people that couldn't get away. There was one lady. She ran across the river and got on a high hill just west of there. And there was this uh, Crow warrior, he was returning from a hunt or something. She said, uh, go tell my brother. They're camped along the Yellowstone River by the, they used to call it the Elk River. And uh, she said, it's by the cliffs where Billings is now. So he turned and went and they told that sister's brother of what was going on. They had them surrounded and that Guy didn't wait for reinforcements. He rode down here alone. He took two or three horses with him, and he just rode. But they were still celebrating their victory, and he got a rope, and he tied a lot of, I'm told it was uh, sharp objects 
TP stakes and whatnot that he'd pulled up. And he got out a distance and he tied that rope to his horse and he tied the other one, it was a long rope, to a tree close to the camp. And they thought he was one of the uh, warriors that were with them, with, uh, with the Lakota. And he stretched that rope tight and he rolled as fast as he can around there and he, he knocked them all off their horses and uh, he single-handedly won that battle for them. And those that had scattered, they all came back to camp and uh, they had a big celebration there. And those are some of the stories that were related to me that occurred in the Mighty Few District here. I was told another story. The Mighty Few District would, the Wyola, where a band of the kicked in the billies, the, uh, mostly the large grass district. And uh, we would associate with them a lot. There's some hills up here where they have the Sundance by spear siding where they would throw arrows and compete against each other. And horse racing was a big deal back then, and they'd have a lot of horse races and whatnot back there. And uh, uh, they told a story of how the Mighty Few District would go over the mountains, over by Buffalo. They'd go south and go over the mountains and just camp out in the Thermopolis or uh, tent sleep area. It was warm over there in the winter and uh, they would, as spring grew near, they'd push further north and they would make a circle and come around over by Red Lodge and uh, kind of come west, get to the Yellowstone area around the Billings area and they would come back and they would come back here in the summer and, gather berries and hunt and come back to our original camping area, which is this general area here. I was uh, told a story of a little girl. She was in a, uh, what they call a cradle board. As they were moving, they were to the end, towards the end of the, end of the line that was going along, and somehow she had fallen out and she didn't make any noise or anything. It didn't take them too long, but they realized that she was missing. And they began looking for her. They stopped and they camped, and the men start looking for her. They couldn't find her. They looked all over. They looked for days. They thought maybe she crawled in the river. They found her cradle board. But they couldn't find her. They thought maybe she fell in the river or something. They looked all up and down the river and they couldn't find her any place. So they spent maybe a week, 10 days or so there looking for her. They couldn't find her. So the camp decided to move on. Her parents and relatives stayed there and they were mourning for her. They thought that she had passed away. And uh, they camped in that general area where they lost her. And, uh, finally, they moved on and caught up with the rest of the camp. And uh, about a year later, they were making their move as they went along, camped in several areas and came back to this general area that area where they had lost that little girl, they'd, they'd uh, seen a, like a family of bears. And there was a little girl running with the bears. And they remembered, they said, there's that little girl, she's been living with the bears. So they chased the bears, the bears run off and hid, but they cornered her. But she was going like the bears, she was mad. And she, but they, finally calmed her down and brought her back and give her back to her family. And she grew up, but for about a year or so, she lived with the bears, I guess the bears raised her. And those are some of the stories that were uh, told us by some of our elders that lived in, in this district. 
and I. The uh, arrow tournaments, they compete against each other in arrows and whatnot. But uh, this, like I said, was a small district. They just used to call us Igoshtagada, those that are few. They started competing in the hand game tournament, and there was just the uh, old man, old man Little Light and his wife, uh, Jim Brown and his wife. Those are my wife's grandfathers. And uh, Pius Rilbert and his wife, Louis Sillomill and his wife, uh, Ben LaForge and his wife, and uh, Adam Birdenground and his wife. There weren't too many of them. That's about all I can remember that played hand game back then. But there were just a few of them, and they took part in the annual hand game tournament. And there was just a few of them, but they sang their own songs. They had their own guessers, and uh, the person that passes out the hiding pieces is known as a medicine man. And But they competed against these big districts like Reno, Lodgegrass, and uh, Black Lodge. And uh, Ed, Ed Little Light, who has recently passed on, he told us that. That's how the mighty few got their name. He said, look, they were visiting and everybody watching them play. And they were playing some big, big districts with maybe 50 people on the other team. And there was about maybe 15, 20 on the Wyola team. But they still played and competed. And uh, there's just a few of them, but they're, they're competing against everybody. And they're doing good. And uh, everybody started talking like that, and that is how the uh, mighty mighty got added to the, you know, the district of the few they call it, and they began calling them the mighty few, and that that's how this district uh, got its name, and that's kind of uh, like occurred like around the 64 or somewhere around there, 1964 or somewhere around there, 65, in that general area. And that's how we come to be called the Mighty Few. We didn't call ourselves the Mighty Few by ourselves. It's uh, mainly the Black Lodge District that gave us that name. What do you see for the, the future of the community and how those characteristics that originally you know, coin the mighty few could be carried forward. Yeah, another another uh, story that was told is uh, before there was very many cars, maybe two or three people around here had vehicles and uh, they all depended on horses or wagons or something to go any place. And uh, without medical care without uh, going to the store every time we needed something, you know. They grew their gardens, they grew their own crops, they raised their own cattle, and they uh, they survived like that. And people would say around spring, you know, uh, the uh, Wyola district, those that are few, will go and check on them, see how they're doing, and they'd come and they'd be prospering, you know, and uh, that is one of the uh, things that has uh, kept this day banded together. They helped each other, you know, and uh, that is how they survived uh, wi winters, uh, harsh winters, and uh, that is one of the stories that was told that uh, they would uh, make it through those harsh, tough winters by what they had, and they'd also hunt, you know. But uh, they'd be thriving when they came to check on them, I guess. And uh, other thing is the, um, uh, like, the medicine ways, the sweat lodge, the uh, 
tobacco societies and things like that, you know. They kept them strong. There's many places upon this hill here, this flat hill northwest of here was a fasting and prayer, prayer area that uh, I'm told when the Native American church was first introduced to this area, they called it the New, new Way. That is where they would have their uh, church services up on that flat hill. And uh, I'm related to uh, an old, old man, Charlie Redwolf, and he would tell us that uh, that is where they'd have most of those ceremonies. And it's a lot of things like that they depended on and relied on that would uh, get them through from year to year. I'm told that words are very powerful. Words are sacred. The Creator had given us the gift of making wishes for people, not just the mighty few district, but all of the Apsaloga, the crow, and uh, our clan children. I'm a whistling water, so sometimes I'll be called on from a uh, children of a whistling water brother, their children, for certain occasions, called on to pray for them, to make wishes that maybe one of these days you have a good education. One of these days may you have a master's degree. And they say, you ask those good things for them, for good health. We go through four seasons. We'll go through them four seasons with you until next year at this time in a good way, in a good, healthy way. And in the meantime, may all them blessings be upon you. They ask those good things, and they say they come true. And uh, they tell us words are like an arrow. Once you throw an arrow in the air, you can't change your mind and retrieve that arrow from the air. Words are like that. It's going to land where you throw it. So they say words are like that. So use words in a good way, they tell us. And uh, it's things like that that they relied on to, to survive, not just the mighty few, but all the Apsaloga. And uh, those were things that were handed down to us through time and memorial. And, uh, we still carry those on today, and uh, that's a lot of uh, things that we need today. It was easy to explain things in our language to young, young ones. Now we have to explain a lot in English, and it seems like it kind of goes in one ear and comes out the other, so we've got to, you know. Uh, really stress, stress a lot of that, so they'll, so they'll carry it on. What do you see as opportunities for young people in this community to incorporate in their life to, to go forward in a good way? Whether it's you know that creating that unity just as a community or connecting to traditions and the yes. land. Yes. Uh huh. Um, you know, I I stress more when I'm talking to the youth. I work in a school. I've been there for going on 26 years now. And uh, I stress to the youth, the elders, the old folks, they would rely a lot off on their land. They would get a lot of lease money. Anymore, the uh, younger generations, as they pass that land on to us, they pass that land on and we shared with our siblings, our brothers and sisters. But that land base is growing smaller as we go along. When I, like my two great grandchildren that were just playing in here, one of these days when they own what land I have, it's going to be an even smaller portion. So I stress education is the uh, only way you're going to make it, and I stress that a lot. And I uh, I'm an advocate for 
uh, education. And I tell them to get all all you can, you know, and uh, uh, hopefully they take that into heart. When I'm given the opportunity to talk to a group of children, the youth in the school where I work, I I stress that a lot, and uh, I think I think they're taking that to heart nowadays, and uh, we see a lot more graduates than dropouts, and uh, things like what's going on right now in Florida, that hurricane, it's causing people to depend on each other for help. And I've seen that a lot during this uh, COVID, COVID issue in this community, uh, people People just really pulled together and banded together to help each other. And that was a bad thing, that COVID. It's still with us. I don't wish that on anybody. And uh, I hope that goes. I hope it's erased from the English language, that word there, the COVID. I hope it goes and don't come back. And that's what happened. It just caused people to pulled together, and uh, there was more unity and more strength by that. And uh, I'd like, not just for something like that, but for our youth, for the sake of our youth, uh, a lot of the changes in the community, the cleaning, the new buildings, we're building a new school across the road here. A lot of those uh, is just bringing our community together in unity, and uh, they're proud of it. Day before yesterday, they had a parade, and that was quite a parade for just a small school like this, and uh, that made us proud to see our grandchildren out there parading and dancing, riding horseback and on floats and uh, singing. They sing their own district song in the mornings before school starts, and. Uh, that that makes us that makes us really proud, and uh, I'm thankful for that. Mm. You know, a long time ago they used to tell us they would uh, cook maybe boiled meat, roast potatoes or boiled potatoes. You know, mm. food. They would leave it on the table, and they would leave. They wouldn't lock their doors. But uh, they would say somebody might come that is hungry. And people would come, relatives, maybe friends, they would eat and they would clean up and leave things the way they found it and uh, move on. And those, those were some of the good things that were passed down to us, you know. A lot of the clan, clan history, the prayer ways and all those, those are the things that hold us together, our, our beliefs. Like I was saying, I'm a whistling water. My clan children are the whistling water children. I'm a child of the Big Lodge. My clan uncles are the uh, Big Lodge clan. And those are things that were passed down by the elders to us and my little grandchildren. They know that, they know. They're, uh, they're greasy mouths. They're greasy mouths and, and uh, they're, uh, children of uh, bad war deeds, and uh, they also know that, but that things that we're passing down, that the elders had passed on to us, and hopefully they'll carry that on. And they tell us that's a form of religion that's like carrying those on. It's like taking part in church, and uh, they tell us those, and uh, that is something that was passed on to us that we hopefully can pass on to the upcoming generation. Uh, a while back they had a powwow. They took turns having different clans dance out there and then they would tell the children of that clan, those are your clan uncles, those are your clan aunts, those are the ones you respect. Uh, we don't just go and tease anybody. We tease our sister-in-laws we tease our, like I'm a big lodge child, I try
child of the Big Lodge, and I teased my Big Lodge brothers, uh, and that's who you're supposed to tease. You have your teasing clan, you have your sister-in-laws to tease. Don't tease your brother-in-laws. Don't tease your aunts and uncles, you know. And uh, things like that that were passed down, down to us, you know, uh, is keeping us as a, uh, as a nation within a nation. And uh, those beliefs hold us together. They told us one day when our language is gone, it's going to be pretty tough if you lose those things that were taught you. And uh, we stress that to our children and grandchildren as much as we can. And uh, hopefully one day they'll carry that on. You know, we teach them how to play the certain games that they play throughout the winter months, uh, the hand games. We teach that to our children, grandchildren. And as young as they are, they, they play and they know how to play that. And uh, the arrow games, we teach them that those little boys uh, that are playing in here, they, they throw arrows a lot. That smaller one will throw so much that they have to go outside and have him put his arrows away before he ever quits. Once he starts practicing like that, he won't quit. So uh, to a certain extent, they've got to make him quit and come in and clean up and eat supper or something. But uh, that younger one, he won't quit. He's quite a little arrow man. The uh, Mighty Few District has won a lot of hand games that we're proud of, and also arrow games. And uh, we're, we're proud to see them do that. They do that, and uh, that's quite a big thing in this district. Uh, they were told a story that was related to me. There used to be a train station over here. The passenger train would go from Sheridan to Billings, back and forth. And uh, the crows could get in that passenger train and maybe go to Hardin, go to Sheridan or Billings, buy things and come back on the passenger train. But when the passenger train was coming, they'd sit over there by that train station. There used to, I remember that there used to be some benches there. The old men would sit there and sometimes just visit, maybe uh, smoke and uh, drink coffee or something, and sit there visiting. And uh, they'd, some would wait there for that passenger train. Baolo in Crow means to wait, wait for something. Baolo. And they kept saying, Baolo. A maulo, they meant that train station. But somehow that got changed around in English to Wyola. That that is how this name came to be. I was told that Dunmore down there by between Harden and Crow Agency, Dunmore area, there was some Chinese that were working on the railroad tracks and uh they try to say we've done a lot of work today or something, but they'd say done more, done more, you know, in the evenings. How are you guys doing, you know, and after work? And those Chinese men were helping build a railroad. They'd say uh, done more, done more. And that's how done more came to be called that. And uh, that's, that's how Wyola got its name was a maulo, it means a place where they wait. And uh, when it got changed to English, they said Wyola, and so that's how the name came to be with us. So they had each clan paint their own emblem up there.
plus that main emblem on the west end. And uh, uh, that to give them more awareness to be proud of their clan, to be proud to be an Absaluga. And uh, they done that a lot. And uh, a member of each clan would sit in front of their uh, symbol several times. I've seen that like drawing gatherings and they relate stories. And uh, later on, they're going to have uh, storytelling session in the evening or so, they're going to uh, have a potluck and uh, they're going to have members of the, each clan sit there in front of the children and relate stories to them. Those uh, women, they say, maybe in modern day, they call her a witch. But she would scare everybody off. People were afraid of her. They called her Hishishtu, a red woman. She, raised, she took pity on a young man, a little boy. She took him in and she treated him right. She raised him. He was fearless. There's a big buffalo north of here. Don't ever go over there. He swallows people. He's the north wind. Don't go there. Every place she told him not to go, he went there. He got clothes, and he had a knife, and he purposely let that buffalo swallow him, they say. That was a north wind. He got in there, and there was a lot of people in there, inside the stomach. They said, why did you do that? We're suffering in here. This buffalo, the north wind, has eaten us up. We're helpless here. Why did you do that? And he pulled his knife out and he told that buffalo, what is this? That's my liver. Don't touch it. What is this? He touched it with his knife. That's my lungs. Don't, don't touch that. What is this? This is my heart. Don't touch that. He cut that buffalo's heart off. That buffalo fell over dead. He cut that stomach open and he let all the people out and brought them out. He was furious like that. Don't ever try to go to the sun. You do things we tell you not to. Don't. It's hot. You can't go there anyway. But whether it was spiritual or what, one day I'm told that he's seen a road that led towards the sun. So he start going along that road days and days and days and he finally got there. He got close and the son told him, why did you come here? I don't like people. That's why I'm so hot. That's why I'm on nothing but a ball of fire. You should not have come here. I don't like people. I don't like being around people. That's why I distance myself so far. I'm giving you light. I'm doing all that for you. You guys should you should have never come and bothered me. But he said, since you came here, I'm going to give you something. He said, go back and take it to your people and use it to hunt, to defend yourselves against enemies. And he gave him the arrows. He gave him a red one. He gave him a blue one. He gave him a yellow one. And he gave him a white one. And those are the arrows that we carry on today. And uh, that is how the arrow was given to us. And uh, they tell us since it was very sacred that the women don't touch the arrows, just the men. And uh, that is how the arrow came to be among us.